Well, hi there, students. This is the final video in the series for our character creation and comic illustration technique. We're going to cover how to finalize the image and to save it and add presentation. So in finalizing the image, we want to work in what's called a non-destructive method. Non-destructive means that you still have the ability to go back and make changes if need be. So not so like, for example, uh, if I flatten all of these images, to these layers together. Now I cannot go back and select just the orange in the shorts because the box might say, hey, I love those shorts. Could you make them purple instead? So non-destructive means somehow keeping these layers. But when finalizing the image, we need to make changes to the entire art piece, which we're unable to do uh, in Photoshop. I could not highlight all of these layers and then make adjustments. So to make big, broad changes, for example, increasing the contrast or making the saturation bolder, I would need to, first of all, turn all of these into one layer. And it's very easy to do that. You just shift click the layers you need to keep. Notice my background is separate. I'm going to duplicate these layers by going layer, duplicate. And notice it's duplicated them now. And they're all highlighted for me already. So finally, I'm going to fuse those duplicated layers together by going to Layer, Merge Layers. And now I have all of my work layers on the bottom. And I can turn all those off. And I have all of my art in one layer. It's to this one layer that I'm going to make all of these changes. So the first change I'm going to do is to double check the contrast to make sure that it's dark and light enough. I'm going to use a Levels Adjust. And to get to that, you go to Image, Adjustments, Levels. The keyboard shortcut is Command-L. We looked at this a little bit in the previous colorization video, but how do you tell if you need to do a Levels Adjust? Well, this histogram actually does it for us. Notice that uh, the histogram forms kind of this mountain range. General rule of thumb is, anytime you see a flat area of land that comes up to the mountain range, that means that you need to bring that arrow up to the mountain range's edge. So as we can see, the white pixel information here has a big gap. I'm going to take that white arrow and bring it up to the foot of the mountain range. Notice the difference. Before, after, before, after. Do we need to do the same for the darks? No. If we did, it would overburden it. And it also tells us that we already have activity in the darks. So I'm going to say, OK. The second thing I'm going to do is adjust the saturation. It feels a little washed out. So I'm going to go to Image, Adjustments, Hue, and Saturation. Command-U is the keyboard shortcut. Saturation is found here, and that's how much color. Zero saturation is black and white. Full saturation blows out the image. So I'm going to bump up the sat to the point where I think it feels bright and colorful enough. And for my opinion, we're in the 30s for mine works. Might be different for yours, might be less, might be more. And now I'm going to say, OK. So before, after. Major improvement. So with that adjusted at this point, now let's shift gears over to presentation. What is presentation and why do we do it? So presentation is when we place our artwork on a silver platter. It's not about the platter. It's about the artwork. Anything that we add for presentation needs to reinforce the artwork. You can do it successfully like this image, or you can do it unsuccessfully, like this image. This is a quiet, minimalist whisper of presentation. This is a rude, in-your-face, hey, look at my silver platter type image, and oh, there's art there. So what is happening in this image uh, is very, very basic. It uses just two things. What's called a vignette, which is typically a square type shape that goes in between the background and the art. What that does is it groups the art together and sets them in space. It also helps it to pop. The second thing that's occurring is the use of rule, which is line. Rule is uh, kind of an element that guides and also groups things together. There are also labels. And the background you know, could be a gray. It could be a gradient. It could be a gradient of a grayish type color. But we never, if we want to use color, we never want to use a lot of it because that makes it difficult uh, to read. You want dark or mid-tone like color or very faded, quiet, muted color. So looking at this color right here, we have very bold, dark vignettes. 
And if we were to convert this to black and white, the gray for the blue would be very close to the gray for the red. We have a big, huge label that says raspberry, not necessary. We get it, the raspberries. We don't need to tell all that. Um, and then all these confettis and stuff and big, thick, ugly, bulky rules here. So um, in general, you don't want to see the presentation first. You want to see the art first. Uh, so now let's look at an advanced student's work. So this is very complex art, and they did a very good job with presentation. Notice the very bright use of text with good contrast. Contrast means difference. That means putting bright things next to dark things. We never want to put dark things next to dark or bright next to bright. Otherwise, we won't see them. Use of rule is used as a framing element in this one. Also, use of vignette. They did a gradient, so it went from a dark to about a medium gray. And notice the background on under which all of this sits. It's one big gradient from kind of a dark gray to a medium gray. So you have gradient on gradient that makes some pretty cool action. No more complex than that, though. Avoid stuff like this, where you clutter and overload the image with the silver platter. In this case, the image, the entire purpose of this is compromised. It's useless because we are to make a turnaround sheet that would go to a 3D modeler. Unfortunately, the 3D modeler would have a hard time reading this because there's just so much junk everywhere. So keep it minimalist, keep it quiet and muted. You'll be fine. So now I'm going to go over to uh, some presentation here and show you how to create a vignette. So a vignette is made using the marquee tool, which is located right here under the move tool. I'm going to select a rectangular marquee and create a brand new layer to do it. My presentation will go underneath my recently squished art layer and on top of my background. It's going to be sandwiched between them. So you just make a marquee tool, uh, just make a box, makes a selection out of it, grab a paint bucket, and I'm going to make a light vignette, Ooh, paint bucket at white, and you can control the intensity of the vignette by turning the opacity down. It makes it see-through. So if, for example, you had multiple vignettes and they overlapped, you're going to get this kind of thing happening. So that makes the image busier. You probably want to avoid that. You can free transform your vignettes by going to Edit, Free Transform, or Command T. If you hold down Shift, you can then work with the proportions. So I'm going to stick a vignette behind these faces over here, but I don't think it helps the faces per se. Uh, it makes it harder to view them because the faces are transparent. It's just the line art. So I'm going to have to get creative with my presentation. Do I make my vignette outside of the faces and subject to them, meaning the vignette is in charge, or do I shrink it down and group the faces, making the faces in charge? Well, I have to do some things to the faces first. So let's briefly pause the video and I'll show you a fun little solution to that. So what I did is I, I painted in some positive space around the heads to make them pop and to be able to see the line art. Let's put a vignette in there and see what happens. Now, because the, the faces are no longer transparent, the vignette groups them together pretty effectively. Also, if you notice, this vignette is a gradient. How do you make a gradient out of a, a vignette? It's actually pretty simple. What you do is, first of all, create your vignette. And then a large, soft-edged eraser, just feather out the vignette. So I'm going to turn the eraser down in intensity, intensity, probably like half strength. Fade it out, like so, and then play with the opacity to make the white not so loud. And then you can free transform and distort the shape from there. Now, the cool thing about this is we can use the marquee tool to cut space out. So rather than drawing with lines to create rules, we could draw with negative space. So using the marquee tool, hit delete. It then trims that portion of the selection. Pretty cool effect, actually. But it's uh, when you cut from a vignette or a gradient, uh, that negative space becomes part of the background also. Pretty neat. So I'm going to get rid of that. All right, so let's talk about making rules using the line tool. So I'm going to create um, a brand new layer. And let me backtrack. I'm not using the line tool. I'm actually using the brush tool. So at full strength and using a brush that's very small, maybe around like six, maybe no larger than 10 pixels, uh, you can 
make very straight lines by holding down shift to move left and right and holding down shift to go straight up and down. So I'm going to create that here. And then let's have a vignette, excuse me, a rule come back down over here. And I'm going to get rid of the vignette to see what happens with the line. Now, one thing to note about doing rules is rules guide the eye. And we want to cut off the line when it intersects with other forms, meaning um, I'm going to basically get a hard edged eraser and then erase where the rule is behind the text. And I'm going to give some negative space breathing room here around the text that frames it. Also, I'm going to go over to these positive forms and erase so we don't have any contact with them. Again, that lets some of the negative space do the work for us. The rules purpose is to frame, group, and guide. And so to guide, you could also pull the eye by creating another rule and directing you over here. So this is going to bring your eye left to right, down, and then back into this area. This is a great way to lead the eye throughout a piece. Though my piece is incomplete, I don't have as many assets as you will. You'll have more faces and different accessories. So you could use a rule as such to pull it over. Lastly, I don't want my rule to be touching the edge of the paper. Let's give it some breathing room with negative space. And with that, that's how you create rules. Let's move on to type. So let's delete the rule layer. Type needs to be just as inconspicuous. Also, this is a gray background, so I would not use black text. I would use white text because the contrast is way stronger. Okay. Also, where you place your labels when you label things is very important. For example, if we have what this face is over here, it's a sad face. And over here we put smug, maybe over here um, underneath the jaw. And then over here we put nerd rage over here up top. There's really no pattern or uh, strategy with these labels. So if you commit to having your labels in one area, do commit for all of the areas of like forms. All of these heads are similar forms. So I'm going to make sure that my labels follow a similar grouping pattern. So I'm going to put them down here. If you put them up here, make sure they all go up there. If you put them up at the top left, put them all at the top left. Also, font size. Make sure your font is very small for your labels. Still legible at a distance. So if we zoom out, I can still read the labels, but they're not like oversized to the point where you have very large words that clash with the rest of the piece. All right. Remember, presentation should be a whisper. Now, the title is important. Uh, this would be the name of my character, whatever his name is. And uh, that would be slightly larger. And we want that to work with the piece. Feel free to use a different font for the title if you want to stylize. You can change the color of the words here. You can change the font here. Scrolling through it, plays with it. Lastly, archiving information. That would be, what is this project? Who made it and when? We put that, it's like signing your art. We put that in the bottom left or bottom right. Very small, very inconspicuous. It's about the art, not the artist. We go find out who the artist is after we've been impressed by the art. So keep it down here in the corner. File saving. When you submit your work, don't send a PSD to your teacher or your client unless they specifically ask for it. And in your instructions, it says either a JPEG or PNG file for this lab. When you're finally done, you go to File, Save As, and choose a format down here under Format. Do not mess with the file extension, OK? Photoshop needs to reprogram the file. So to change it to a JPEG, we would go to Format and then click JPEG. To change it to a PNG, we would do the same only for PNG. JPEG is a little different than PNG in that when you save it as a JPEG, it asks you for the quality of the image. I always leave it maxed out. And when you do this, you will lose all of your layers. Now, when you file Save As, it creates a new file. But this is still my PSD file, as you can see, and I've made changes to it. So if I want to save those changes and go File Save, it will still be my PSD version as well. So let's look at the desktop. Here is my JPEG. Here is my PSD. I've got both of those files. And then this image is ready to be sent off. So that concludes our series. There are thousands of ways to work in Photoshop. And these were this is just one of them. And this is the most basic, introducing you to a variety of tools. 
Um, digital painting is different than this process, so we'll be moving on to that after this lesson. And I hope you guys found this helpful. As always, please feel free to send me questions if you want me to expound further. If you're working in class and you know, questions are good, it shows that you're learning. So I look forward to seeing you guys again. Take care, everybody.